Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1965 film Libido, and this is a film I got from Severn Films. And I'm going to tell you right up front, it's a black and white film, and it looks so crisp. It looks so nice. Severin did a very good job with this one. I haven't watched any of the um, special features yet on this, but at some point I will do that. This is one that has a slipcover. I'm not, like, wild. Like, it's an okay slipcover. Um, that is a better uh, look, but that's also what's on the inside. So I kind of wish they would have, like, flipped it. I don't know. But anyway, small things, artwork things, not a big deal. But they did a great job with this making it look very crisp and nice. And I don't know about other people, but watching like a very clean, nice looking black and white film just feels cozy to me. I don't know. That's like the best way I can describe it. I just feel like it sounds kind of weird to say that, but like, I don't know. That's how I feel about it. It makes me feel cozy. Um, I did like this film. I'm going to get in depth on it, obviously. So let's get into libido. Directed by Ernesto Gestaldi, who only did a few directing credits, one of them being Cheers to Cyanide, as well as Vittorio Salerno also doing some of the directing, who also directed No and The Case is Happily Resolved. Now, a lot of people will say Gastaldi, that name sounds for, so familiar, Ernesto Gastaldi, very prolific screenwriter in Italy. Oh, and by the way, on the topic of Italy, this is not a giallo film. I've heard some people call this a giallo film. It's not a giallo film. Um... Does it feel a little bit giallo-ish? Yeah, in certain ways, but it's definitely not a giallo. Um, one small thing about it is I believe this is like pre-giallo era anyway. I think the very first recognized giallo film, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, was like 69, I want to say. It was definitely after this one, but yeah, that was a Bava film, which I think is amazing. Anyway, written by Gestaldi, uh, who also did... I'm going to run through these kind of quick because it's a lot... The Vampire and the Ballerina, Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory, The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, The Case of the Scorpion's Tale, All the Colors of the Dark, The Whip in the Body, Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, Torso, The Suspicious Death of a Minor, The Script, uh, The Script, The Scorpion with Two Tails, The Case of the Bloody Iris. A lot of great giallo films in that listed. Also, Salerno was involved in writing this. He's also done some films such as Killer's Carnival, Cheers to Cyanide, Dead Men Don't Count, Fast Hand, Pistol for a Hundred Coffins, that's a great title, uh, and No, the Case is Happily Resolved. <laughs> it's kind of a weird title, but... Um, and the story for this was provided by Mara Merrill, who also worked on scripts for Cheers to Cyanide, The Great Alligator, which I want to check that one out, and The Scorpion with Two Tails, so... A lot of working with people before going on there. So, Salerno's brother was considered for the role of Paul and would have worked for free, supposedly, but also wanted prosthetics that would have ended up hurting their budget too much. So, that that's a rough one. Um, they could have gotten, on one hand, a free actor. On the other hand, he wanted these prosthetics. I guess he was very insistent on this. So, they were just like, uh, yeah, no, we can't be doing that. Uh, also, hopefully my microphone is good enough, but there's someone mowing their lawn. I can't control this, but I think my microphone should be good enough to filter that out. But apologies if you hear any of that. The opening Freud, Sigmund Freud quote, points at a childhood trauma being the reasoning or deviance for any sort of killer that may pop up in this. Because I know as people are watching this, they're thinking, oh, <clears throat> especially if people think it's a giallo film. They'd be like, oh, there's going to be like a killer here. And there is, you know, there's not someone who is already killing, but there is, well, other than uh, Christian's father, but people are thinking here comes a killer. So the whole like childhood trauma, it, it's something that's been used in Giallo a lot as a motivation for this is what gets the killer going. This is what makes them snap. And obviously in the end of the film, I mean, that's at the root of what happens with Christian and why he eventually does snap. And doesn't kill anyone, but kills himself and leaves Brigitte to maybe die on her own. Because it is a very secluded place. They make a point of saying this is a very secluded house. So yeah, but um, I like that they start with that quote in a way. Because it's interesting, I always like when they start with quotes and then you're kind of like, 
what is the significance of this, this story? But I also feel like it then is a little too on the nose and leading to let you know what's at the heart of things. But that said, they then start with that <clears throat> opening scene of the actual trauma being shown that Christian went through when he was a child, being seeing his father kill a woman and him like literally watching the woman die as she was kind of like strung up on this bed with all these mirrors around. So the it's it alludes to the fact that he was, as they would say, a sexual pervert back then or a sex maniac, which is said a lot in Giallo films, um, <clears throat> usually alluding to people being violent along with, you know, being very sexually interested. Um, I did like the setup with that as the trauma. I also like that they use the Jiminy Cricket uh, sound box or a music box. And then that ends up being the last thing you see at the very end of the film. So it's kind of like this full circle ordeal. So I like that about it. Paul's set up as a real killjoy in this film, though, as he's annoyed by the radio that um, Brigitte is bringing with her. Now, obviously, that radio is going to end up playing an important part in the film later as part of the grand scheme that helps give Christian that push over the edge, literally and figuratively. So, yeah. Immediately, I'm down with how cool the old house looks. Listen, I'm a sucker for cool-looking locations. I'm especially a sucker for interesting architecture in film, especially older films. So this one got me, and I think that's one of the things I really like about it is they used this old mansion-looking house to great effect. I love all the giant plants that are kind of throughout the main entryway. I love the really creepy, interesting looking staircase. I love the creepy looking basement. Like it's interesting architecture. Now this is just a thing for me. I don't know if anyone else out there is, is into it like I am, but let me know in the comments if you also love seeing very interesting architecture in film. So loved it, <clears throat> love the house. Excuse me, sorry, pause for horror hydration. <clears throat> Paul talks about no houses being close, uh, which serves to establish isolation to ramp up the feeling of danger whenever the actual horror aspect of the film kicks in. Like I was saying before, it's not only that, it is also that it sets you up with the knowledge that when Brigitte is tied up and everyone else is dead at that point after Christian jumps off the ledge or the cliff, where the same place his father jumped off and killed himself, you feel like she's done for because no one will come and find her because this is not the current age of people being very online and easy access to cell phones and stuff like that. So there were no cell phones, obviously. Paul definitely seems attached to the house and seems to dislike the idea of Christian selling it once he turns 25 because that's a stipulation. So it's basically Christian gets the, the house and the inheritance. He's married to... Um, Helene. And so if Christian's not there, then Helene gets it. And then if Helene's not there, then Paul gets it. He gets everything. So knowing that early on in the film and seeing that Paul is very much against the idea of selling it and seeing how like possessive he is of the house and everything in it sets you up with the expectations that he would end up being someone messing with Christian, that he would end up being the person to kill some people in this film. So it's a good way of kind of pushing you towards him, towards Paul, as a red herring. Plus the fact that the actor that they got to play him looks like he could be a villain, let's be honest. He looks a little shifty. And he plays it shifty in many, many ways, even though in the end he's not. They do a good job of showing you Christian's struggle with his memories when he sees things like the infamous room where the death happened and the portrait of his father. That's all nonverbal acting. It's all in the face of the main actor who plays Christian. And I think it was really well done. And they showcase it really well in the way that they shot the film as well. This film looks good. It, lo it looks quite good. And the other thing is they did a really good job with lighting. Obviously, lighting is even more important when it comes to black and white films than it is with color because you can show like differing shades of a lot of things when it's just color, but they did a great job with the lighting in this. I was impressed. They go pretty hard on the talk of being concerned that Christian's unstable. Um, some would be better, but the other thing is I understand that back in this time period, you know, scripts just were more heavy handed. It was more acceptable. 
over the decades, it's kind of gone more the way of being a little more subtle and a little more nuanced with it. So I just understand it's kind of like, it's a script of its time and that's fine because that's, you know, it's obviously of its time. <clears throat> the shadow at the top of the stairwell confirms what Brigitte said when they showed up, that someone was living there. Now, in retrospect, it's interesting that as soon as they show up, Brigitte's like, it looks like someone's been here. Kind of like planting the idea that it's not just going to be them in the house for the audience, but also for the other characters. So that kind of is a way of her to kind of like make people a little bit paranoid in the first place while she's involved in this scheme with Helene to end up getting the inheritance. Which you don't see that coming because she plays stupid pretty well in this film. I did enjoy that. She did a good job. Christian looks like such a pervert when he's standing watching Brigitte and Paul in the bedroom together. I do like the lighting in that shot with the light kind of in the middle of his face and then the shadows on the side. It just kind of like has it shining right here. And then when he starts like, he starts getting upset and alarmed of the fact that he's like looking and watching this and feeling like, oh no, I'm turning into my father. And he starts backing away from the door and they keep that light like right in the middle of his face. So it's a very like purposeful positioning of how he's backing up. And it looks cool. It was a great shot. I really, I really like that. Christian unknowingly digging his nails into his hand show that he has the ability to zone out and cause harm. He has the ability to snap to a degree. He doesn't fully snap in this instance, but you get a small taste of the fact that he could. So it sets the audience up to believe that he could snap and he could be the killer. So it makes it even more believable when later in the film, Helene is like, you're the one who's been doing this to me. The, the bruises, the cuts she's been showing up with that he notices, she says, you've basically been blacking out and you've been doing this to me. So for the audience members, it becomes believable at that point because of what he does to his hand unknowingly and then just kind of like realizes like, oh my gosh. Like his paranoia about becoming his father and the fact that they talk so much about him having been, you know, seeing a lot of doctors for his mental trauma and the quote in the beginning of the film really sets you up to believe that he could be the one who would kill. The sound design really does stand out when it's the, the killer POV. That's the type of shot. Uh, the killer POV and you're hearing footsteps. It's also very much effectively creepy. So I love that aspect of the film. I'm a huge fan of when you can really take note of the sound design in a film, and this one does it quite well. I like how Christian isn't subtle at all when he's checking out Brigitte when she's in her bikini. Uh, there's a lot of sexual tension between Christian and Brigitte, and I think that's very obviously done by Brigitte, I think, to get Christian closer to her in order to not kind of draw any suspicion in any way, shape, or form to make him like her on a deeper level. It's not just, oh, she's nice, I like her, but also she, I mean, she even says at one point that she would like to sleep with him. So, yeah, she, she pulls him in even closer, so he's less likely to think ill of her. It definitely seems something is going on between Paul and Helene because of when Paul says he's counting on their marriage and that he's the reason that the two of them met, and that's right after Helene saw someone in her room and didn't say anything to anyone. So that whole setup right there becomes very suspicious for the viewer because you're like, yeah, these two seem like they're very much in coots, which is obviously exactly how they want you to be thinking because Helene's up to something, but Paul is actually not up to something. And I guess they, like, they both are up to something because they're supposed to be contacting the doctor about their concerns with Christian, you know, being triggered in this house. But we find out that Helene never even makes the call, even though Paul believes that she did. But it, they do a great job of making you believe that these two are in cahoots and that they're the ones that have something going on. 50% of that is accurate, but what they're doing and how it comes to that, it comes to the end state, we don't know. It's surprise enough. I do like the uh, very cool scene of the rocking chair with the smoking pipe sitting next to it that's supposed to be like the ghost of Christian's father, basically. I love the way they, sh they shot that. And then I also really like how they kind of show you how it was done later on in the film, how Brigitte set it up with the Jiminy Cricket music box. I like that. 
I like how you can tell without it being said that Christian is afraid to have sex because he's scared that his father's tendencies will come out. Um, again, this is this is from an acting perspective. It's really well handled handled in that sense, and it's a lot of like physical and facial acting. Basically, it's not said really. Oh, I guess it gets said like slightly here and there, but it's not said as much. Apologies, I do have to take another drink. Okay. Confirmed even further for me that Helene is involved when she says that Paul would have to get rid of her as well as Christian to get the inheritance. Because of that statement, and you assume, based off the setup of the film, that inheritance is going to be at the core of what someone would kill for with this story, her making that statement leads you to believe she is definitely involved because... She's basically saying Christian can't just be gone. It would have to be me too. So why would anyone be going after Christian? Well, that makes you think that, okay, well then someone is going after Christian or trying to mess him up in some way or another. So then she has to be involved because otherwise they then have to go after her. And she's showing up with like bruises and cuts and everything, but she's not being killed by this person who's like creeping around, you know? So... And Brigitte drops the bomb on Christian that Paul and Helene have known each other for years. Now, obviously, this was part of her plan because she wants to get him even more paranoid so that he starts looking primarily at Paul because he has a much cl closer relationship with Helene. And from the beginning, his relationship with Paul is a little bit tense. Um, and that's shown immediately in their disagreement, not uncordial disagreement, too about what to do with this estate. Definitely unsettling when Christian starts playing around with his gun while he's waiting uh, in his car spying on Paul and Helene. I thought that was a good moment that kind of points to there might be something going wrong up here at this moment with Christian, giving the audience again the idea that he could just end up going off the deep end. So good scene for that reason. Good suspenseful moment when you can't tell if Christian is going to hurt or hump Brigitte. The moment in that, you know, mirror-lined bedroom where uh, he starts putting his hands near her neck. And at first you think he's going to start strangling her, but then he kind of puts it like on the side. And you're like, well, maybe he's going to try and have sex with her right now. She said she wanted to have sex with him earlier. And then it starts to become like somewhat violent. And this is where you start to see the cracks. This is where you're seeing the toll on him happening from the memories that are all coming back to him while he's in this house, and the game, the head games that are being played with him by Helene and Brigitte. But at this point, you you kind of suspect Helene, but you don't really suspect Brigitte. Good scene when Helene is telling Christian that he's the one who's been hurting her all along. I already kind of talked about this scene earlier, but it bears repeating that it's very impactful. And they set everything up in a believable manner that you as a viewer could also think, oh, okay. I mean, I guess he has been kind of like blacking out and doing stuff to her maybe, but no, that's all part of the master plan to get him to think that to drive him further overboard so he would kill himself. The Jiminy Cricket music box rocking the chair is kind of, uh, kind of lame in how it's revealed. I like that it is revealed how it was done, but the way in which it's kind of done is a little bit lame because it wouldn't have the ability to move the chair the same way. But then again, this is a movie from the 60s. Believable enough, right? Definitely suspected that Paul would be pushed off the cliff. When he starts going towards that cliff and how long of a time they take and how they were like showing these camera shots over the cliff and everything, I was like, where's the person to push him? Where's it, where's it, where's it going down? And sure enough, it happened. And Paul, gone. Good scheme that Helene and Brigitte came up with, and it's funny how Brigitte plays stupid the entire movie. Funny but effective, and I think the actress did a really good job. Um, she's still kind of acting that way at the end of the film after, like, everyone almost is gone except Christian. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe that is just who she is. She's just smarter than you would think. Things backfire when Christian does, does turn into his father, basically, because Helene and Brigitte pushed him too far. So that's where this very genius plan turns in, it turns into a t terrible plan because their idea to push him too far, they didn't consider that he might hurt other people and not just himself. So he doesn't actually 
like he doesn't kill Brigitte, but he does tie her up and leave her for dead, then goes kill and kills himself. Which I was wondering if he would, you know, keep himself alive or not. But as soon as he starts going towards that cliff, I'm like, yep, this is it. He's going to kill himself. The film begins and ends with this Jiminy Cricket. Uh, I wonder how Disney felt about this. Because uh, he's very front and center in the beginning and the end. It's very Jiminy Cricket. The ending does get drawn out a bit too much, I do think. The pacing does suffer a little bit towards the end. But overall, I think the pacing is pretty solid especially with the help of what I was talking about, very interesting architecture at the house. And this deals not just with trauma, but also the fear of becoming just like your parents. So it's childhood trauma, but it's also everyone's fear of taking on the worst personality traits of your parents. I know everyone's kind of gone through that before, and it is kind of like a thing within society where it's like, oh my gosh, you're turning into your parents. You know, there are some good things to emulate, but there usually there are some things you don't want to emulate. So this plays heavily on that, along with the trauma. So it's effective. It, it's a pretty good film. So out of four, uh, out of four, out of five stars, with half stars possible, I'm giving it a very solid three and a half star rating. Considered four a little bit, but it feels right at three and a half. So I did enjoy this. This is where I'd love to hear from other people who have seen it. Go ahead and put it in the comments. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Were you in between on this film? Would love to hear your takes on it. And uh, yeah. So thanks for watching this. Uh, do me a quick favor and hit subscribe to my channel. If you haven't already, hit the notification bell button so you'll know when I'm putting up new videos. Uh, I appreciate watching, uh, especially watching this video uh, right now and getting this far. <laughs> but thank you so much. And until next time, keep it brutal.